Hello Besties, we've talked about Hana on the channel before and we are going to do that again as it was requested. Hana had an interview that was published here on YouTube three months ago at the time I'm making this video. And the interview was one of the cringiest ones that I've ever sat through. It wasn't professional to my standards and full of lies. Anna Fullendorf, also known as Hannah Talks Bodies, is full of crap, and that interview did not fail to show that. The mood for the interview was set from the first three minutes in, and the host herself was walking on eggshells with her vocabulary and asking permission to express herself. Like, what? The whole thing was a mess if I'm asked, but what do I know? Using the word fat in a casual, non-threatening, morally neutral way takes the negative power away from mm. it. The word fat is both a noun and adjective that does not care about anyone's feelings. Just like any other word, if you feel threatened by it, then it is an issue that you yourself have and must work to the roots of the way said word or words make you feel and why so that you could heal from it. Hannah does proceed to acknowledge that the word fat is neutral, to which the host responds by thanking her for taking away the stigma around the word fat. Are you kidding me? In terms like curvy, again, they pathologize fatness as a disease, which it's not. It's a natural part of body diversity. This is one of the most ridiculous things that I have ever heard. Body diversity? Are you serious? These idiots in fat acceptance must be applauded by the land they go at to try to convince people that being obese is something natural. Obesity does not happen in nature, my friend. You develop it and nurture it with your own lifestyle choices. They just sort of send the message that like fatness is so bad that it's literally unspeakable. Mm. So we need to create these code words mm. so that we can avoid the word fat. Mm. According to Hannah, those words are code words to avoid the word fat because being fat is so bad. What if I tell you that those words were never originally used to describe obese bodies? The fat acceptance movement is the one that hoped on the wagon and started using those words to describe obese bodies. The word curvy was intended for bodies such as Marilyn Monroe's, voluptuous without being skinny. The word is derived from another one, curve, which means not straight. Women with broad shoulders, a smaller waist, and broad hips are the ones the word curvy was picked to represent. Michelin is not curvy, and that's what the folks in fat acceptance are. A bunch of Michelins appropriating anything that they can justify their poor lifestyle choices with. I have always existed in a larger body to varying degrees throughout my life. Just because you've been obese most of your life does not mean that obesity is normal. It is not. Something happened that made you gain weight and it can be anything. Poor relationship with food can develop from anything and not just trauma. You may have been crying too much as a child and your parents could have fed you more junk just to quiet you down. You may have been bullied at school and to escape you could have turned to food making things even worse for yourself and your body. There are many ways you could have developed a bad relationship with food, and you obviously have, but just because you have spent 95% and plus of your life as obese does not and will never mean that it is natural to be obese and there is nothing wrong with obesity. And Anna herself admitted to engaging in disordered eating from a very young age, Disordered eating is a bad relationship with food that causes you to either not eat enough or eat too much, and in Anna's case, it is the latter. In the interview, Anna says to have turned to an HAES or health at every size therapist for help. Listen, 
The notion that anyone can be healthy at any size is wrong. You cannot be healthy at 300 pounds, for instance, especially if the majority of that weight is fat. And just because the human body can carry that much fat and more does not mean it should. Another point that Anna mentioned was to have lost 80 pounds just to regain it all back and being frustrated about it. I get it and I sympathize with her, but if you lost weight in a not sustainable way, then you will always get that weight back and possibly more. This does not mean that weight loss is not sustainable because it is. It does not mean that your body gaining the weight back is because that original weight is your set point weight as they like to falsely claim in the fat acceptance world. Anything that you do that feels like a chore is always going to be temporary. It doesn't matter whether it is weight loss, exercising or even a job, anything. So many people who lose weight and gain it back is because they set themselves up for failure before they even started their weight loss. Look at my 600 pound life. Many individuals in that show struggle to lose weight because they start the wrong way. You can't just go cold turkey and expect to succeed. If you eat 3000 calories a day at 300 pounds for instance, Getting your calories to 2000 daily will provide you with fast weight loss, yes, but that will also be temporary. Why? Because that is a drastic cut way too fast and that is why contestants in that kind of show usually fail and why many outside those shows and without the proper guidance fail, including Hannah herself. But because she failed at weight loss, she now spreads the false narrative that obesity is normal and healthy because according to all the deluded in fat acceptance and health at every size, this is probably just how your body is supposed to be. Wow. There is no scientific, like it just doesn't, there is no guaranteed way to turn a fat person into a thin person wow. forever. This is the fuckery that they like to hear in that community. First of all, Hannah admitted to consuming made up information to stroke her ego and lack of fortitude for weight loss. And by made up, I mean misinformation from health at every size. There is scientifically proven research out there that no one is born obese and people become obese by eating more than they need. You don't become alcoholic by just staring at a bottle of liquor and no one is born an alcoholic. It takes consumption of alcohol in an out of control manner to become an alcoholic. The same is true with food, drugs, and anything else that people get addicted to. So the idea that permanent weight loss does not exist, as Hannah claims in this interview and on her social media pages, is the reason why she has followers, because people are lazy. Yes, I said it. People are complacent and don't want to do anything anymore, even if their life depends on it. And that is laziness. Everything must be delivered to them on a platter. That is why instead of learning how to cook, many would rather choose to eat out or have the food delivered to them. Instead of counting calories to know how much they eat and drink, they will just tell you that it takes too much time and too much work. Instead of eating to live, they will live to eat because weight loss requires them to do some work and that is like asking them to give you a leg. But guess what, dear fat individual, your obesity might literally cause you to lose that leg one day to amputation. Your body is not designed to sustain lifelong weight mm. loss. Nobody's is. And that's not a fault of yours. That's literally just how biology mm. works. <gasps> Anna Fullendorf and everybody pushing this idea are idiots. And I mean every single word in that sentence. What she just said there whether from her or her so-called therapist, is an insult to anyone who's ever gone through famine and starvation and is going through it even now. That statement invalidates the Jews who lost their lives in concentration camps. 
the populations in area in the world where access to food and water is very limited. Places like North Korea, Ethiopia, Yemen, Somalia, Sudan, Afghanistan, Sri Lanka, and many more. Heck, even here in the United States, there are people who don't have the privilege to be glutens like Hannah and her friends in the fat acceptance community. Have you ever seen an obese homeless? I personally have not. This is not to say that obesity shades you from homelessness because it does not. But an obese individual who will become homeless will also lose weight to a point where they will no longer be obese because they will not have the means to indulge in food as much as they would before becoming homeless and wandering the streets. And them falling into drugs in the streets will also contribute to them losing weight, which some drugs do. Hannah talks about having chronic pain her entire life. Well, you've been obese for the majority of your life. It only makes sense that what follows is chronic pains. You force your body to carry more weight than it should and you expect it to be faithful to you when you're not faithful to it. More weight on means more pains. Your joints have more weight to support. Therefore, at some point, they are going to give in. Same with your back, just to name a few. Pain is an indicator that something is wrong. You experiencing chronic pain when you're obese means something, and your obesity is causing a lot of that pain, if not most of it. I'm not going to dig further into her story with the doctor asking her to lose weight before surgery, as I did that already in a previous video, which I have listed in the description of this one. But the way she tells that story over and over is to me an indicator that she embellished the story in her script in an effort to make everyone else involved in that story a bad person, and she the good person people must feel sorry for. Surgeries are dangerous as a whole. The risks are going to be even higher the more body fat you carry. First of all, during surgery you are laying down, so pine and prone positions are contraindicated positions for obese individuals because of their airways becoming obstructed in those positions, which in the worst case scenario can kill them then the huge amount of anesthesia can make their heart stop too. The bigger you are, the more anesthesia you will need. These are two main reasons why surgeons will advise their obese patients lose as much weight as they can before surgery to mitigate the risk of the procedure. This is by no means to body shame or fat shame the obese individuals, but ensuring that they receive treatment in the safest way possible. That is their dirty in an effort of doing no harm. I had to live with a broken back for a whole year. If you haven't watched the video that I just mentioned, and again, it is in the description if you will want to watch it after this one. To give you a summary of Hannah's stories, she ate herself to obesity since before she was five years old and her obesity caused her to develop back pain. Four or five years ago, she decided to do something about it and went to see a doctor who told her that the damage that had been done was so bad that she had a broken back and needed surgery to fix it. Because she was obese, the doctor asked her to lose some weight in an effort to keep her safe through treatment. And instead of losing weight, she fought him for one year to avoid weight loss and ended up making her back situation even worse. And now, according to Hannah the liar, it is a doctor's fault that she is living with permanent back pain. She also framed that story in a way that not just the doctor is to blame, but to spread the message that she did not receive treatment because she was obese. That is not true either. Treatment is always available for obese individuals. They just turn it down because according to them, they know better than the doctors. Obese individuals and teen individuals cannot be treated the same way. When it comes to surgery, a teen person would not be asked to lose weight before surgery because they are not carrying an amount of fat that will complicate the surgery and will put them at higher risk. This is what it is all about. 
the needs of an obese person cannot be addressed the same way as the needs of a thinner person would be. But that doesn't mean that the needs of obese individuals are not addressed at all. The only barriers are those that obese individuals put themselves between them and the treatments they need. But sure, it is not their fault because nothing is ever their fault. Give me a break. He showed me through his behavior that he did not respect me. He did not value my health. My health right. was not a priority to him. And this business is how you defame someone. Correlation versus causation is something that Hannah likes to talk about, but it is worth mentioning that nothing Hannah talks about is done so in a way that is truthful without pushing some type of agenda. Correlation is the relationship between two factors without one causing the other, while causation happens when one factor causes another one. Hannah's message is that the amount of fat that someone carries does not cause health issues. The type of messaging that we have been fed around fatness is that it's like this well understood, guaranteed scientific fact that fatness causes health problems, which just like could not be further from the truth. With that statement, she is telling the entire world that she herself does not understand the difference between correlation and causation. Unless she is choosing to be deliberately dumb and ignore all the research that has been performed to date, showing high amount of fat to be causation to health issues. Did she not say that she now has permanent back pain ever since she was a child? She has been obese ever since she was a small girl, starting before she was five. She needed surgery for treatment. Was that not a health issue? That developed because of her obesity. Again, causation is one factor causing the other, while correlation is a relationship between two factors without one causing the other. Anna herself is an example of obesity being a causation of health issues. She debunked her own lies. What I hate about her trying to explain her idiotic point so much is that she added racism into it to fit her narrative. It's been well established for a long time that there's a very strong correlation between race and mm -hmm. negative health outcomes. Mm -hmm. It's actually not race, it's racism. Mm. According to Hannah, racism causes negative health outcome and she tells you it is that allostatic load right it's that constant stress and stigma that you experience when you are the victim of prejudice and discrimination mm. in short the oppression and stress that your race has endured is why you are more prone to bad health outcome though she does not say which race it is implied the black race and therefore being fat is also a race because fat people are also stressed and oppressed and therefore prone to bad health issue. That is how Hannah Fullendorf explains correlation. And don't worry if I did not make sense because she does not make sense. The fat acceptance does not make sense at all. All I did was paraphrasing what she said to avoid showing the entire segment and risking a DMCA. But yes, thanks, Anna, for telling me that my depression and suicidal thoughts are the result of years of stress and oppression of my race. You know what leads to poor health okay. outcomes? Being denied yeah. health care. No, Anna. Fat people are not denied health care. You deny it to yourselves by refusing to follow your doctor's recommendations and choose to blame the system because victimhood is your happy place. In short, the interview was a load of nonsense because according to Hannah and everybody else in the fat acceptance community, being obese is normal and the world has to bend over to accommodate their poor lifestyle choices. The second half of the interview is full of lies and there is an effort to push political biases as if that's not pushed enough already and now she wants to politicize health. Let me ask you a question, Bisties. What happened the last time that health was politicized? Hint, it started in 2020. See how that turned out. Obesity is a matter of health, 
not a matter of politics. You are not healthy if you are obese. It is okay to lie to yourself that you are, but to enroll others in your lies is criminal because people die following those lies. Fat phobia is extremely profitable, especially when it comes to healthcare. Really? Hearing this was infuriating because, again, she got back to her back pain story to talk about how the doctor wanted to refer her to their weight loss program. The assumption here and that borderline would flirt with slandering is that the doctor wanted to force weight loss surgery onto her. Listen to her explain it to yourself. Saying like, I'm going to create this problem and then I'm going to offer you a paid solution wow. for the problem that I have imposed on you. Wow. This woman is very infuriating and maddening. The reason the doctor mentioned weight loss program was to let you know that help is available to help you lose weight because you need help to lose weight. He was trying to help you fix a problem that you yourself created and now you accuse him of creating it himself? I don't know what caused you to become obese in the first place, but you have chosen to remain obese and contributed in that back pain to develop to a point where you will have permanent pain. How is that the doctor's fault? Accommodation for obese individuals was the theme of the last third of this interview. Again, the idea is not that there are already accommodations made for obese individuals because that has been done, but rather that there is none. Hannah even goes to say that it should be made illegal to discriminate based on weight. Discrimination is illegal and it is based on things that you have no control over such as your race, your religion, your gender and sexual orientation. You do have control over your weight and therefore weight cannot be protected under discrimination law. Refusing that a 500 pound person rides a horse is not discrimination. That is protecting the horse because there is a limit that horses can sustain without breaking their back. The exact number depends on the horse weight, height, breed, etc. And yes, horses have a spine like you do. Barring someone from applying to the military because of their weight is not discrimination. Imagine obese officers at war. Damn, we are gonna get killed. You can't have it both ways. You either eat too much and forfeit some pleasures in life, or you eat moderately and enjoy most pleasures in life. The choice is yours and you make that choice every single day. Anytime I apply for a job, I'm always like, how can I make sure that my body looks as acceptable as humanly possible and not being denied based on their perceptions of me as a fat mm. person? The larger you are, the worse it oh. is. I do agree with Hannah with that sentence as it stands by itself as far as health is concerned. The larger you are and the higher your risk for a lot of health issues. But to come back to the concept of job application, Hannah is not being honest. First, she is very vague in general, and I believe that this is on purpose because the more vague she remains and the less likely she is to be challenged on the claims that she makes. Nowadays, you don't walk into a company to deliver your resume in person that has been replaced with online applications. Now, Hannah says to have been discriminated for jobs because of her weight, but she does not tell you what jobs. You need context and she does not provide that on purpose. The military has weight and height requirements. Flight attendant jobs, though there is no weight requirements, still requires a good fitness level. You need to be able to manually open the doors, for instance, and those are heavy. And you need to be able to assist others in case of emergency, among other duties. Being a flight attendant requires a healthy and fit body, among other requirements. You also need to be able to fit in the aisles without issues, as well as the cockpit if necessary. And the cockpit is among the tiniest spots in a plane. Any job that requires physical fitness will be a no-no for an obese individual and that is not discrimination. So 
Every time Hannah had a job interview and did not get the job, she automatically assumed it is because of her weight, or at least that is what she is telling you. No, Anna, you did not get the job because you failed at convincing the people interviewing you why you were the person for the job and no one else. And your weight was not a determining factor. There is a book that the fat acceptance keeps citing and at this point in time, that book is like a bible to them. The book is called Fear in the Black Body and it is by Sabrina String. Why am I talking about it? Because Hannah brought it up in the interview. The book in itself seems to be about racial injustices experienced by the black woman through history from the renaissance times till now. The key word here are black woman. This is important because fat acceptance tends to co-op every possible groups to push their own agendas. I have not read the book, but if the light is shed on the black woman and her body in general and how she's been treated poorly through the year, the white gluten woman appropriated that story and history to justify why she as an obese individual who became obese because of her own doing, is now oppressed and needs allies because fat phobia is rooted in racism and the obesity epidemic is not real. Have I lost you? This is what's happening in the fat acceptance community. So, to the black women in fat acceptance, you're a sheep because the Caucasian counterparts are not fighting for you, but for themselves using your platform. LGBTQ+, and in the fat acceptance movement, you two are a sheep, my dear, because you two are having your platform used to push misinformation and dangerous messages. This is not a racial or gender motivated message. It sounds bad, but guess what? The truth does not always sound good. There is a bigger picture here, and if you pay closer attention to fat acceptance and what they're truly doing, you will understand the real danger of that movement. Thanks for watching, besties. Train me in.